Hi, it's Colleen and welcome back to my channel. I've been very busy making all of the pieces for my 18th century costume. It's a lot and I didn't realize how much work goes into having a, a really historically accurate look with all of the pieces and parts. You've already seen in previous videos that I've made all of my undergarments. You put a lot of work and time into making the underpinnings and nobody will ever actually see them because that goes under your dress or under your bodice or under your outer petticoat. But now I'm making the things that people will see. And these are the accessories that really take your costume and level it up a notch. This is the American Duchess Guide to 18th Century Dressmaking, and it's an invaluable guide for historical customers. This has incredibly useful instructions for all of the pieces that you'll need to make to have a historically accurate 18th century costume. I'm making three projects out of this book, the apron, the fichu, and a cap. Let me show you how it was done. A fichu is basically a neckerchief, just a piece of fabric that's worn around the neck to cover up your bosom for modesty and a little sun protection. Every woman would have had one of these and you see them in paintings all the time. I'm gonna throw some images up here while we talk. A fichu can be a square that's folded in half and then tied around the neck. It could be a triangle or it can be a shaped piece of fabric. And it could be either white or it could have been made out of a woven or printed material. So there was a lot of options when it came to fichus. I chose to make mine out of a white cotton and linen blend fabric that I found at Joanne. You can see that the neckerchief pattern here is actually just a triangle with a slit cut into it so that it can go around your neck. This has it at 35 inches on the square with the diagonal cut across and a three and a half inch cut into it and then you just do a simple rolled hem around the edges. I modified the pattern after doing some research online. I don't know whether this is perfectly accurate, but I'll tell you how I got here. I cut the slit as directed on American Duchess, three and a half inches. And when I put it around my neck, it was really bunchy. So I thought, well, maybe I'll do a scoop. I have this great little bendable, flexible ruler. This is an office supply ruler or an art, like a drafting ruler, it's a lot cheaper than the sewing rulers that are made the same way. So that's a handy tip for you. Buy some of your things at the office supply store. But anyway, I wrapped it around my neck and figured out what my curve was, and I sketched that out on the triangle. Then I pinned it back and tried it again. And it still was just bulky and strange, and it was hanging on me funny, and I just don't want that much fabric up around my neck. I want the modesty that comes with having uh, a neckerchief or a fichu over my bust, but I don't want gobs of fabric because it might be hot or I might have a hot flash. Like I just don't want all that stuff around my neck. So I tried it on, cut away a little bit, tried it on some more, cut away some more until I got one side that I was happy with. Then I just folded this and mirrored the cut. So it looks a little strange, but once it's on, it actually falls really nicely and doesn't have a lot of bulk around my neck. I'm happy with the shape and the way it drapes, and now I'm going to finish off these edges. I'm pretty certain this rolled hem would not pass any kind of inspection, but it's my first time of doing a real rolled hem, and this is the first time I've had a fabric um, when I wanted to do a narrow hem that would actually roll. So when I did my bum pad, the fabric was too stiff. This fabric seems to want to roll. And basically, I mean, it's kind of gross, but I'm like wetting my fingers. A little bit of beeswax would work. And then just kind of rolling this until it creates that nice little narrow hem. This is the bias edge of the triangle. So I don't know if that's going to affect how easily or not that it rolls, but right now it's going okay. This is just, it's awful. It's so wobbly and <laughs> crooked. I should have known better than to try this on a bias edge because it's just, it's gonna stretch. There's no way around it unless you baste it first, which I didn't do and I probably should have. Um, I think it's gonna be fine. Like I said, you know, it'll wrap around your neck and that part will be hidden in the folds, but my gracious, is that ever crooked that is so bad so needless to say i would not pass inspection um, on this i have starched it you can still see i have some wet starch still there but i've starched it and pressed it and steamed it and that's as good as it gets you have witnessed it that is my first attempt at an official rolled hem and i would declare this merely passable 
<laughs> anyway, I'm going to do those straight edges now. The two straight edges together took half as long as the bias edge and it looks twice as neat. So I think that I have a lot of work to do on rolled hems. <laughs> I put a poll on Instagram about whether or not to add this lace edging to the edge of the fichu. This is about a quarter of an inch wide lace edging and I bought it from Gilded Feathers uh, Etsy shop. This is a vintage trim. I got 13 yards of it for I think $4 and then I paid for shipping. So it was a really good deal. It is cotton. It's not antique, but it is vintage. So I'm gonna go ahead and stitch that right along there. Um, I'll take, it'll take about just under two yards to do the edge of the fichu. And I'm only doing the straight edges. I am not doing the bias edge because that's just gonna be hidden anyway. You can kind of see how that's gonna look right there. I think it's going to be a pain, but it'll be worth it. There's the finished point of it. I love how it ended so nice and even right there on the edge. Looks really, really lovely. I'm glad I went the extra mile on that one, even though it was a bit tedious to sew on. I also made an apron, and an apron was an essential accessory for a woman at that time. Not only did it cover up her gown and keep it clean from the spills that were inevitable throughout the day when you're cooking and cleaning, but it also was useful to dry her hands, to grab a hot pan off the fire, to gather vegetables from the garden, or to wipe a child's tears. When you think about all the ways a mother's apron comes into use, you can imagine how important this piece was to any woman at that time. So I've made one and I'm gonna show you that today as well. It's 35 inches long by 48 inches wide. Here in the center is a dip of one inch tapered out to the sides. The point of that is that when you tie it around your waist and like maybe put it underneath the point of your bodice, that dip will allow it to curve around while keeping the hemline level. I have already cut my fabric. I have trimmed off this scoop uh, on the top edge. So this point right here is an inch shorter than this point right here. So I'm going to open that up. Once again, my stash is failing me. I have a ton of cotton twill tape, but unfortunately not much that is white and I need pretty much like two yards and this is just short of that. So I decided to make a little waistband out of some scrap of the same fabric and it's just an inch and a half that has been folded twice and then that way I can sew it along the top, trim it to fit, and then stitch on two ties and that will take care of my waistband and my ties. That's the plan. Now what I need to do is finish all three edges of this fabric with a narrow hem and then I'll put in gathering stitches on the top of the fabric, gather it down to half of my waist measurement and then bind it and put on the ties. Pretty much a lot of ironing and stitching. I don't think I'll show any footage of this. I'll just show you the finished product. Me again. I wasn't going to come back until I got done, but then I realized that I could probably use the same trim on the edges of the apron. And I'm wondering if I can sew down the edge and sew on the trim all at the same time instead of having to make two full passes around the edge of this thing. So I'm going to give that a go. That is working really well. This is the back side and I am just stitching it on like I did before, only taking just a little bit bigger bite of the fabric underneath in order to secure that raw edge and the trim all in one. So it's a little more noticeable of a stitch, but it's saving me quite a bit of time. So I'm okay with it. Yeah, that's gonna be nice. I have a lot more to go. I'm gonna go watch a movie and do this while I watch. You can use a pin to just adjust those gathers and make them nice and neat. Now I have already done that and I pressed these gathers. I, I find that it makes it a little easier to control them just by giving them a light steam. So don't mash your iron down, just hover it over and steam them and they will relax a little bit and it makes it easier to manage it. So now I have this tape that I made it is just, it's not cut on the bias, it's just a straight grain, but it's kind of a 
bias tape, right? It's double fold. So I will stitch this on. Let's see, I'll start in this direction. I'll stitch that on in the fold and then I can flip it around to the other side and tack that edge by hand. So I'm gonna leave these basting stitches in until I get it stitched to the first piece. Then I will trim the waistband to match the measurements that I have here. I'll trim all the, the threads, I'll make it all nice and neat. Then I will fold it, insert my tape, tack it down by hand on the other side and call it done. Here's the finished apron. I love the way the edging turned out and I will show you this piece with the rest of the outfit at the end of this video. Another piece of important historical costumery is the cap. Every woman would have had their hair covered at all times. It really wasn't done to go outside with your hair uncovered. A cap was really practical actually because it kept your hair up and out of the way and it helped keep it clean. So you could wash the cap often, but you wouldn't wash your hair maybe as often. And honestly, let's think about it. If your hair is always up and covered, why would you need to wash it? It's going to stay fairly clean on its own. So the cap is an important part of that. They could be fancy or they could be simple. The one I made is somewhat in between. I'm going to go with this cap and there is a pattern here. We'll see how much of it I can actually do by hand. It does call for this narrow hem on these edges again, just like, there's a narrow hem on this. So my plan is to machine stitch the parts that won't be seen and only hand stitch the edge of the ruffles that will be seen. Okay, I have an issue with this pattern, a real issue. And I think that must mean I have an issue with the historical people because I think this is based on a historical pattern. Okay, number one, this piece in the middle just gets entirely too small. And there's no instruction to say allow a seam allowance, it just says here's the pattern. So you assume that the seam allowance is sort of accounted for on this. The other patterns, obviously not, it indicates when you're making mock-ups and doing linings and things for the dresses that you should add a seam allowance, but it didn't say that here and it didn't say how much. So I didn't add one and this piece of fabric that we're attaching these ruffles to is extremely small. The other issue is that I cannot make these hems nearly as narrow as what it calls for. I don't have the dexterity with my wrist issues. I hate every minute of making this. I'm hating it. I'm hating it. I think that there should have been clearer instructions, number one. It doesn't say how deep to make your, your um, ruffles, so you're guessing um, it was needlessly, I mean, the, the pattern is measured out, so it seems like it would have been very easy to say, make each ruffle, you know, X number of inches or whatever. I think I would have, going back in time, I would have just machine sewed as much of this as possible and forgot, just like forget about the historical accuracy and hand sewing and whatnot. Um, and in the end, you end up, if you want, which I think I do, you end up putting a ribbon kind of around this area of the cap. So you don't even see this. So why am I hand sewing this, all this stuff? Why? <sighs> anyway, I'm frustrated. It's really more about me maybe than about the pattern, but I do think that this little piece here in the middle should have been redrafted to be significantly wider, maybe twice as wide, because then once you get done with all your hems, you know, you have a little bit more space to work with and it's just a little easier to manage. My fabric is not as light as the fabric that they used in the book. So that's another issue. It was the best I could find. That was a linen slash cotton that was sheer. It was the best I could find. 
uh, at Joanne. And I didn't want to order something and not be able to touch it and see because I did order previously some muslin that looked like it was really sheer and it just wasn't. There it is all finished and ready to be attached to the rest of the hat. I hate this project. I hate this project. Hate it. Okay, now I'm going to put in an eyelet just above this right here. And that's where I'm going to put in a gathering string to be able to adjust this to the back of my head. You are witnessing my first ever hand sewn eyelet. I could not do this on my stays because my hand just didn't allow it. But I think with just one being required on this project, it's okay. So I'm to mark the seam right above here and pierce the fabric with an awl. And I do have this little awl. So I'm going to go all the way in and that doesn't cut any fabric or any threads. It simply spreads them apart. So now I can stitch around that. I have never ever done this. So I'm going to go back the other way too. Never, never have I ever. So it's my understanding you just whip around the edge. Like you don't have to do a lot of complicated buttonhole stitches. You, I mean, you can, but it's my understanding that just whipping around the edge is like enough. This is going to be the ugliest thing ever. When you don't have practice with something, you can't expect it to look like someone who has had years of experience doing this thing. You have to start somewhere and the more you do, the better it looks. I think about the type of sewing I was able to do when I first started sewing. I'm light years ahead of that now. And I didn't get there overnight. It's taken quite a few years of sewing. I've been sewing, actively sewing, um, probably only for the last maybe 15 years. Before that I sewed occasionally. I had a sewing machine and I knew how to use it, but it stressed me out so much having to change the thread that I rarely used it. Um, and I just didn't do much in the way of apparel. I didn't know anything about fitting. I just didn't, didn't do much. So all of the skills that I have developed have come over the last maybe 15 years. And my skill level for historical sewing now comes down to about the last six months because when you're making modern apparel or like sewing for your home, you're not doing this kind of work. You know, you're using zippers and buttons and hooks and eyes and modern techniques and this level of hand sewing just isn't required. So I'm giving myself a pass on some of this. Okay, well that's not half bad. So it says once you stitch it, you open it up again with the awl and I can just bury my thread let's see if i can get this around like underneath some of these other stitches i've already made and that supposedly is secure enough not bad not bad i'm okay with that i don't want to do 50 of them but i'm okay with it i hand sewed the casing for the drawstring and that's done I hand stitched up to the point where the pattern indicated that the gathering should start and then I gathered it in halves to match half of the call length. So 11 inches from here to here, 11 inches from here to here. So now I've pinned it in place and I'm ready to stitch this on to one side of this band and ruffle thing. I've decided to go ahead and make this ribbon decoration right here. And the way American Duchess describes that is to take a length of ribbon and divide it evenly. And you basically do running stitches at each of your marks and then attach it to your cap and that makes the poof. Once again, I would say that this is where the instructions are lacking because it's very clear how, how long this is and it's very clear how long your poofs are. So why not just say every three inches or every two and a half inches and take the guesswork out of it, but they didn't. So what I've ended up doing is deciding that I wanna have here at the center of my cap, I wanna have a big bow. So I want my poofs to come down from there. And I just divided the length 
evenly and kind of played around with this until I arrived at a fullness that I liked. And so what I have is 11 inches on each side of my cap and I want five poofs. So each poof is just about two and two tenths of an inch. So I've measured that along the way here and marked it. And then two and a half inches, once it's gathered, you'll see that it makes like a little poof. And then for the bow, you do two six inch lengths and it does tell you six inches. You stitch them together and bunch it like that. And then do the other one going the opposite direction to make a four loop bow. I'm not sure what I've done to deserve this, but this hat is too big. Just like everything else I've been making in this series of projects, it seems like everything is too big. So as I mentioned, um, I was going to put on this little trim and I do love how that looks. So I'm really happy with this, but I, I put on some hair pieces and like tried to make a big head of hair, but this, I don't know, it's too long from here to here even when this is all scrunched up. So I did end up taking the tucks here. It's just not working. This is long and it's shallow somehow. So no matter how I do it on my hair, it just doesn't look right. And I wanna be able to wear it without having to put all the wigs and hair pieces and things on if I don't want to. And then, you know, still have room for it if I do. You can see how that comes down to a point and then over. And I am just going to do something like this, right? Just cut, cut that corner off right here, starting the drawstring up here. It will go down through the channel all the way to the back where I already have an eyelet and the same thing on the other side. Then I'll be done with this. I do not like this at all. I just don't like it. I would have much rather just made a regular old mob cap, you know, a circle with a drawstring or elastic and a, and a little ruffle around the edge of it, just a simple one. I would have much rather done that than this um, even though it does look cute with a little ribbon on there, I just have, I'm just not happy with it overall. And it was just a boatload of work. It's starting to look like a complete outfit and I'm so excited. So here you see, I have the fichu and it does a nice job of covering up this part of my bosom. I can tuck it through the strings on my stays and then my jacket will go on with this being at the top. So looks great. You can see that the hat looks decent now that it's got the big hairdo to go with it. I don't know anything about historical hair or 18th century hair. I did reference the American Duchess Guide to 18th Century Beauty, which talks a lot about the different ways you could arrange your hair depending on the time period. But this is a pretty basic, you know, everything's up and under the cap, but it would have still had volume with the help of hair pieces and cushions and things like that. So the hat looks better now that it's got bigger hair. And then here is the apron. Now I didn't think a white apron on a white petticoat would show up very well. So I threw on this skirt, which I had in my costume closet. It's from like a Dickens style dress that I made for a church production, but it's big and voluminous and long and I knew it would fit over the, the bump pad and provide some contrast for this. And I think even over the bump pad, you can start to see how that silhouette will take shape. This where it comes in on the sides here feels like a little much. But again, I'm sort of counting on the weight of the skirts to take that down a little bit. The material I'm gonna use for my final outfit is heavier than this skirt. So it should pull that down just a little bit more. But I was excited to be able to show you what this would look like with a skirt. The next video in the series will be the making of the bodice and the skirt. I can't wait. I can't wait. And hopefully by the time I get the outfit done, the shoes I ordered will be here. I am not investing in a pair of American Duchess shoes just yet. I will show you my budget hack for historical footwear when they get here. All right. Thanks for joining me. Take care. Have a great day. And I'll see you next time.